Hey friends, please remember that this episode is brought to you by M3 Virtual Accounting. If you're looking for somebody to help you handle your finances, whether that be personal or business related, especially if you have got a virtual business, maybe selling things on Etsy or Airbnb or a podcast like mine, you are probably going to need some help navigating what it is to file taxes as a small business. So check out Molly Morris at M3 Virtual Accounting. You can get a totally free consult with her and find out what she can do to help you. That's m3virtualaccounting.com. This is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is some spoiled, the song of ice and fire to the co-host which are the rereading and return to Westeros HBO spoiler edition on cut uncensored and too hot for TV, bringing you chapters 66 and 67 of a dance with dragons. Tyrion and what's the next one? I, I know it's Barristan and sell me, but I don't remember if it's called something. Hold on. Uh, the King breaker. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Delightful. In these chapters, Tyrion signs a contract and yells at Penny. <laughs> and Barrison Selmy takes the king into custody for probably poisoning the queen, maybe. <laughs> Welcome to Unspoiled. Monsters are dangerous, and just now, kings are dying like flies. I am the king! Fuck the king. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. I'm Rashawn. All right, so, these two. Yeah. Y'all... <laughs> these are some of the most like drawn out for no good reason Darian's especially so much nothing this mm. motherfucker was signing his life away like I don't know how many lives they think he's gonna have <laughs> but at some point it is enough I couldn't believe how long it went on. So Tyrion starts. The pile of parchments was formidably high. And he makes a little joke basically like, don't you trust me? And Ben Plum is like, lol, sign. <laughs> and it's him, this guy Inkpots, who is like their sort of uh, accountant type Mm -hmm. And then there is a very cranky man who does not think much of Tyrion and always, keeps, like, threatening him. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember what his Castorio. name is. I'm trying to... Thank you. <laughs> um, and we just have a lot of convo between these guys about the contents of these papers and Tyrion's like thinking about how likely it is that they'll even ever be able to get this money from him because he'll probably be dead am I going to regret this at the this point I don't regret it because I'm doing what I need to do to mm. stay alive um and there's a lot of like internal monologue right uh, uh I'm dancing as fast as I can. He wanted to laugh, but that would have ruined the game. Plum was enjoying this, and Tyrion had no intention of spoiling his fun. Let him go on thinking he's bent me over and fucked me up the arse, and I'll go on buying steel swords with parchment dragons. Which is funny, because the very next thing says, Tyrion was promising to pay the bearer 1,000 golden dragons. He shook his head, laughed, and signed. And I'm like, well... You just said that you weren't going to laugh because you mm -hmm. wanted him to keep his illusion. But then you laugh right after that. So which is it, my guy? <laughs> Not that much time passed that you should be confused on this point. But 
I, I just thought that was a, a weird moment. I was trying to remember what the fuck we were even doing here. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> because what's happening, there's two things happening. Because there's, there's mention a couple of times about signing the book, right? Mm-hmm. And the signing of the book is when Tyrion becomes an actual sort of official these are the second sons, right? Right. But before they let him do that, he's got to fill out all of these promissory notes. Mm-hmm. So it's like he's both buying the cell swords and becoming one of the cell swords. <laughs> so to remind you of what was going on here, basically Ben Plum knows who Tyrion is and is like, how about I just bring you back to your sister and she'll give me money for you. And Tyrion has to convince him that not only will my sister like rip you off and claim that it's not really me and not Mm -hmm. pay you, but I could get you more money for keeping me alive. Right. Because they are escaping being slaves of the old man that had bought him who got the pox or whatever that disease is Gray going mare. around. And uh, the pale mare. That's it. The pale that, mare. That's the one. <laughs> the, the, the girl green. that arrived on a gray mare was, was that it was a whole other thing. Black. <sighs> <laughs> um, so he's he's trying to ensure his escape out of slavery and and hopefully back to Westeros or maybe maybe not back to Westeros. He's still on his way trying to get to um is it Marine? Yeah. He's on his way trying to get back to like get closer to. He um, wants to see Daenerys because he's like kind of hoping that if he presents himself as I'd like to fuck over my own family and the Lannisters are your mm-hmm. enemies. So maybe we could right. be buds. And, yeah. uh, and it's, and the, uh, Jorah is also involved in this as well as, is Penny. Um, and, but, but of course, like you just reminded me, this is Tyrion's master plan on how to get them further along on their journey and out of bondage. Um, yeah. I really appreciate it because he's, this stack of papers is probably tall as he is that he's fucking signing. And mm-hmm. as they go on, as he gets closer to the end and he starts writing the notes to like the higher ups, the the rate is increasing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, this is uh so this is a, a long section here being told what he's going to do because he's not good for fighting. And um they say you're going to work for ink pots which he's like yeah that suits me just fine that makes sense um and ben plum is basically like we're giving you this job because it's a low profile not many people are going to see you because Tyrion makes a joke about how he's going to go and hang out with some of the camp follower whores (laughs) and ben is just like the fuck you will because those bitches do not know how to keep their mouth shut (laughs) so somebody will find out that you're here if you do that so don't be a fucking moron and follow your dick to your doom like you like you you always do time (laughs) (laughs) doom dick um so yeah that's i mean that sounds like a pretty decent setup you mm-hmm. know like working for uh this this Tyrion says i love books and it's funny because like it takes me a minute when i'm reading this to remember that he's serious because he's just so fucking sarcastic all the time right and i take everything <laughs> as a joke if he uses strong words especially if it's positive right I'm just like oh wow asshole oh wait no he means it <laughs> When um when they're done signing and he's about to like they you know go work with ink pots and they're like we got to go get Tyrion some gear so mm-hmm. send send him out to the to the wagons have him pick out some shit to wear something for the girl too and uh, ink pots is like uh, go get your woman and Tyrion is like she is not my woman perhaps you should get her all she does <laughs> is sleep and and glare at me these days. Ink <laughs> says, well, maybe you need to beat her harder and fuck her more often. 
You know, one it's, or the other. Who knows? But, Women. You guys, Mysterious. What a world. What a fucking world. <laughs> uh, so he goes to get Penny, who is sleeping in a corner. And I really briefly want to touch on this guy, uh, Tybero, who is from King's Landing. And this, he has like, a, or no, not that's not the kid from King's Landing. He um, is ink pots. He says, "I always pay my debts as well." And then there's a, a kid that he talks to eventually. But the Tybero name, I don't remember if this is something that winds up being anything. So I'm not bringing him up just to be like, "Remember this name." I'm I'm sort of doing it for that, but for me also, not because I know of anything, but because I just. You know, it sort of caught my attention that this is brought up here, and I thought maybe George was yeah, trying, trying to, to be, trying to be slick. Yeah, this is the one you know. that Tyrion is like that almost sounds like a Lannister. You some long lost mm-hmm. cousin, and the guy goes, "Perhaps I always pay my debts as well. It is expected of a paymaster." Sign. <laughs> and Tyrion decides to sign in blood because that used to be the tradition. Oh my and, uh, god! Even though the guy is like, that does not make for good ink, and he's just like, yeah, whatever. I'm doing it anyway. I'm like, are you just hoping that the ink is so bad that they won't have any record of this by the time they get to cash in that your right. your blood will have faded away? Um, yeah. but yeah, then he goes to see Penny, and this bitch, I am sick of her. <laughs> it so is so sick of her. Like she, I, I have like in a corner of my cold dead heart. A small smidgen of empathy for her, but she is so tiring at this point. Very, very tiresome. And I feel so bad about feeling bad about how tiresome she is. (laughs) Oh my God. Eventually Tyrion slaps her and I was like, good. Thank you. Somebody needed to do it. Like she saw her asking for the pig. And the dog, and like this, this, the she doesn't. And I know she's supposed to be young, you guys, but I'm really starting to wonder if there's supposed to be more going on than just that she's young, or maybe she's just much younger than I really understood her to be. Um, I don't know. Like, she just. She says something like, uh, at one point, she's like, oh, I need to sign, too. Like, you know, should I sign? Mm-hmm. And he has to be like, no, that's not what, that's not what this is. Yeah. Um, and uh, Tyrion says something about, like, we being referring to the second sons. And she's like, oh, so you're one of them now, huh? And, like, what is she No, thinking? he says they, and she says... You should say we if you're one of them now. Oh, you're right. You're right. We. She says if you're one of them, you should say we, not they. That's right. Oh, you know what? I take it back there because that's a pretty good observation on her part. Yeah. I actually thought that was one of the few moments where I was like, hey, you contributed yeah. something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm just like so like, kind of sick of her shit. I just mis- misinterpreted that. A little bit. Mm-hmm. A, little, a little bit. Um. So he's like, yeah, we got to go find some armor for you. And um, she is confused by, like, that. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's like, look, we're supposed to be just like, he says, likely lads. Yeah. Which is a weird phrase, and I feel like it means something other than what I took it as. Um, I think it's meant to be like, we're supposed to sh- be like n- newbies that a show potential oh okay you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah. okay that works that works but uh either way they're supposed to be fucking trying to blend in as much as they possibly can which is already difficult because of their height right Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. he's like we need to just try to like look like we belong here in case there's some slave catchers watching because you know i don't know if you remember or not but like we're slaves and we, yeah. we broke a very serious law <laughs> and you know we could be snatched up at any time and like thrown back into the pits or to be auctioned off to whoever else wants to buy us nets like this is a very serious situation that we're in 
Yeah, she really wants to go back into slavery. She just keeps on being like, they were good to us and it was better than this. And I had my, you know, my show and they, and Tyrion still hasn't told her that they were being set up to be eaten by lions. And at this point, I feel like he should fucking tell her. Like, I don't, she might not believe him. So maybe that's why he doesn't bother is that he feels like she's going to think that he's fucking with her. Mm. But like, I I really was at this point kind of just like, just fucking spill the beans on that man. Because she feels like she got robbed by him of like a good home. Yeah. And it's like, girl, you just got saved from being dinner for the fun of people who are sick in the head. I really wonder if she would believe him at this point. Um, her desire to hold on to a fantasy, yeah, is, is which which granted is better than her reality, you know, in a lot of ways. But she's so steeped in it; she's holding on to it so tight, and has yeah. really been since she showed up. Like she has had great difficulty adjusting to the re the ever-changing reality of her situation like she's always mm -hmm. talking about back when it was her and her brother and how we used to do this and how we got along that way and if we can just make them laugh and they'll take care of us and like she's just like always two steps behind what's actually happening yeah that I don't know if she's like in a position to accept the the truth of what their deal was and how they were going to be fed to lions. And that was going to be like a big fun Saturday for everybody <laughs> that was at the games or at the pits yeah. or whatever the fuck they're called. A big fun Saturday. <laughs> I don't Sunday, know. Sunday, Sunday. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucked up. Um, but yeah, she's just so incredibly tedious for me. And like, this is probably the point of her that she's meant to be a, an exact foil to Tyrion, who is super adaptable, who can read people really well, who can understand mm -hmm. the ins and outs of what people are doing and why they are and what they want and what they're ultimately after right. and how she just has none of those abilities. Right. But and it's not fun to read. I think, I think you're right about the fact that she's supposed to be such a perfect foil for him. And it also makes his insistence on drag, basically dragging her along with him, kicking and screaming that much more um if not compelling at least intriguing mm -hmm. you know because everything we know about Tyrion from both his inner monologue and these these current chapters and everything we've learned about him from the previous books he should have cut this tether a long time ago and normally yeah. would have because if there's one thing Tyrion's going to do it's going to make sure that his ass is okay Mm -hmm. right and he's going to do whatever he has to make whatever kind of deals he has to make to keep saving his own ass which is yeah. admirable you know like I don't hate him for it I'm not mad about it at all but it mm -hmm. does make it very um, almost out of character that he is like saddling himself with this young woman and the only thing that really makes sense to me and it, I hate to reduce it to this maybe it's supposed to be more than this but that she is another um another dwarf dwarf yeah dwarf Ugh. <laughs> my black scent just will not allow me <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that is like I think it's also just her being this clueless, it's like, it's not even just leaving somebody behind who is not good for your operation, but it's leaving somebody behind who genuinely seems to have no idea how to conduct themselves and knowing like their fate is going to be particularly nasty, probably, right. you know? And I think part of that is, she is a dwarf, and so her fate would be explicitly more horrible due to the fact that she is a dwarf. Like, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Like, I think that Tyrion has a keen idea and insight into just how terrible life would be for her. Yeah. Um, in a way that maybe she 
doesn't slash can't slash won't envision. Yeah. You know, like I don't like she's I don't know if it's lack of experience, it's uh chosen denial, but she clearly doesn't seem to understand just how ugly this world can be, mm-hmm. especially for someone like her. Um, and because Tyrion has no illusions about the ugliness of the world, maybe that is enough to keep him dragging her along, kicking and screaming. Yeah. <laughs> Snatch was waiting by the cook tent, chewing sourly when the two dwarfs turned up cloaked and hooded. I hear the two of you are going to fight for us, the sergeant said. That should have a pissing in Marine. Either you ever killed a man? I have, said Tyrion, and I swat them down like flies. What with? An axe, a dagger, a choice remark. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Though I'm deadliest with my crossbow. And he says, how many men do you kill with that? And Tyrion says nine. He's like, yeah, my dad counted as nine people, I think. <laughs> and this dude, even though Tyrion is lying through his teeth and inflating the number, he is not impressed by the inflated number either. Not even. Not even a little bit. <laughs> nine. <laughs> um... um and this is the, there's like a kid that they run across and this is the one that is from King's Landing. Uh, and Tyrion can tell by his voice. And he says, there's no one clever as a Kingslander, they say. That seemed to startle him. Who says that? Everyone. Me. <laughs> Since when? Since I just made it up. For ages, he lied. <laughs> <laughs> oh Tyrion he's trying to get this kid on his good side for mm-hmm. some reason yeah he asked him he's like did you know Lord Tywin and this little kid whose name is Kim is like the hand I saw him once riding up the hill you know the cloaks the lions on their helms I did like those helms though I never liked the hand <laughs> he sacked the city then he smashed us on the black water so that he smashed us on the black water tells us a little something something Tyrion yeah. picks it up right away he's like oh you were there uh, and the kid starts talking about how Lord Tywin came up with Renly's ghost and took us in the flank and all that stuff um, which has got to be for Tyrion hearing once again how this battle that that was ultimately won, he gets no credit for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like, like, he's just been erased from the history of it. Um, it's so infuriating because they even do that in the show. Mm-hmm. They even mm-hmm. take away the, his participation with the chain in that plan out of the show so that it's like, come on, man, you can't even let him have this here? Like, mm-hmm. Well, they yeah. let him have the wildfire thing on the show at least. At least, but <laughs> the chain I always found to be like more interesting. But I don't know, maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, and I also like this kid. I just want to take a pause here and be like, uh, he, I ran, and when I got back to our ship, they said, "Where's your spear? We've got no room for cravens," and they left me. And I just wanted to laugh at like how choosy stannis is being y'all lost you lost you don't get to be picky right now about who you take back with you you need everybody that you can get and you're out here just being like "Uh uh-uh you're not good enough like finding mm. this out is so infuriating like to find out that that they were telling people nah you can't get back on the ship wild shit you guys for real get real please my god like ideally sure i get it but like what do you and it's not even like he was craven like he he wouldn't fight it was craven because he thought he saw a literal ghost which is a very different situation in my mind you know like it seemed like the fighting he was down to do that it was just once we started involving like some supernatural shit that we, you know, begin to have uh-huh. second thoughts. And I think that is a reasonable line to draw <laughs> myself. I don't know. Um, and especially because, well, 
this is a stretch because I'm not saying that Stannis himself was on the ship that told this kid he can't get back on it. But we know Stannis is dealing with the supernatural as well. So, you know, you would think that the men would have a healthy respect for, mm. you know, that kind of energy, you yeah. know. Um, yeah, it's just disappointing all around. <laughs> I do think it's really funny, though, how everybody is like, oh, yeah, that was definitely Renly's ghost. And I'm like, y- another person wore his arm. Like, that's not even like a, a, a dramatic thought to have that somebody else was just wearing oh, I the loved, armor. I love that guys. everybody just agrees. That, oh, well, I saw the armor. It's got to be his ghost. <laughs> like, what do you think happens? Does somebody dies and their armor just disappears? So if it's maybe they're supposed here, to be buried with like, maybe they're supposed to be buried with it. Maybe. My my thing is how are how hard is it to recreate someone's armor? That's an interesting question. I have to assume it would take a long time, but I don't know how long it takes to make a suit of armor. I feel like there's something about this in uh um Duncan Egg actually though. So, but maybe that I think that might have been just a shield. Nevertheless, should uh probably take some time to do and you know even if you don't get it exactly right if your armor is close enough from far away people are probably still going to be like oh hey it's him you know um so i just feel like this is a particularly easy grift to pull off and it's just funny to me how many people go for it and (laughs) don't question it one little bit i guess Um, like identity identity thief back then is just doesn't have to work as hard as the, they don't have to work that hard nowadays apparently when data breaches are just giving everybody social security number up at one time so <laughs> girl oh god girl. that shit has been truly like, like insane lately the the way that that we all are just like meh mm-hmm. i guess fine I guess. What are we supposed to do? Freeze your credit. That's the best you can do. Freeze like, credit. They're welcome to my credit. They can improve <laughs> it for me. I don't know. That shit is not good. Um. Anyway, okay. So then they have a talk about like how he loves this pot shop that made bowls of brown. And T- Tyrion says, ah, I called it Singer's Stew. And he's like, why? And Tyrion's like, ah, because it was so good. You'd sing about it <laughs> and i was just like sir <laughs> this dude out here just he just impro improvs every conversation he has Listen, and just he like is all about the whole other universe it is all about knowing your audience Tyrion is going to to concoct a tale specific for whomever he is talking to mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. like and that is like such a talent it really is. It is such a talent to be able to like whether he doesn't always get it right, but he always fucking tries it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, and when that shit works, it really works. I have never really been very good at it. But um man, people who can do it, next thing you know, you it's got handy. People, it's so fucking handy. Mm-hmm. It's how you become like a really good salesman. That's why I was never good at sales. Even when I worked retail, I was never good at it. Like just don't have that knack i have always been good at this part of like customer service but i don't have the pushiness for sales so that never like i can get along with people and and start a conversation with small talk i don't enjoy it but i am very good at it Mm -hmm. but uh when it comes to the point where you have to try and sell them something yeah I am so like, well, I made this person like me and now I'm going to ruin that by trying to sell them something. They're going to think they're going to think I was only being nice to sell them something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave their illusions that they've made a new friend, please. Uh, so, anyway. yes, so he asks uh, Tyrion, what does he miss? And Tyrion thinks to himself, the first thing he thinks is his brother he thinks of Jamie. And yeah. then he thinks of uh, the women. Uh, and then he says out loud, I miss wine, whores, and wealth, especially the wealth. Wealth will buy you wine and whores. Um, and the kid is like, is it true the chamber pots in Castle Rock are made of solid gold? <laughs> and Tyrion actually says something true. 
He says, you yeah, should not once. believe everything you hear, especially where House Lannister is concerned. They are twisty snakes, the kid says. And Tyrion laughs and says, snakes? That sound you hear is my lord father slithering in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, like surprised at this because I expected them to be trying harder to keep who Tyrion is secret. And they just are talking about him being part of House Lannister listen, and his oh, yeah. daddy. Like, I, they, I just thought we were going to be a little bit more low key than when, this. When he's know. signing the books, he asks, like, who should I sign as? And they're like, oh, mm-hmm. you're signing that shit as Tyrion. Mm-hmm. Like, no, you're not fucking around, Hugo, or whatever other fucking YOLO, or whatever the fuck you got going on. <laughs> like that god. <laughs> <laughs> that will never not be funny. Uh. um so eventually they're looking through all of this uh weaponry and it's like pretty shitty stuff that's fucked up and rusty but even so there's usable things if you are of average size but Tyrion being so small and penny being small plus being a woman so probably not quite having the upper body strength he does although who Mm -hmm. knows she did a lot more physical like tricks so she might be stronger than Tyrion um but they have to be a lot choosier in what yeah. they use they, and uh Jorah shows up in the midst of this looking very frightening I love they're going through the stuff for Penny and uh she puts on a helm and it's too big and it's also open face and he says to her I'm fond of looking at your nose I'd rather you keep it and she's like <gasps> You like my nose? Are there other parts that you like of me? Ma'am. Tyrion is like, perhaps she meant it to sound playful, but it sounded sad instead. And he tells her, I am fond of all your parts and even fonder of mine own. So let's let's redirect this conversation please Mm -hmm. (laughs) i kind of felt like fond i'm fond of all your parts was like a bad reply when he follows up with even fonder of my known i was like all right maybe that's fine but i really Mm. felt like oh she's gonna take that away dude i don't know (laughs) so now she's still asking like why do we even need armor we're mummers we're just gonna we just pretend to fight and he's telling her look you're gonna have to pretend very well like this is all right if i'm going to tell you that this is a mummery that we're just pretending but i need you to take it seriously like this is not our little circus act yeah you know um and i think this is when uh jura shows up looking he is fucked up y'all yeah he is he's looking better than he did but yeah Mm -hmm. he he was he was getting fucked up like his his he he was oh and that's no good like his face is barely a face anymore and they and i think that this was mentioned before but i had completely forgot about it he's got that tattoo on his face Mm -hmm. that like indicates that um not only that he was a slave but that he was like i think a like difficult or dangerous i forget exactly where it is it's not even a a tattoo by the way it's It's a a brand brand. yeah 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 so i think that this was punishment because he was like so uh what's the word i want truculent i suppose that'll do um but i can't remember because i know that like Tyrion doesn't have this brand penny doesn't have this brand and they were both also slaves. So was it, I, I feel like it had to have been because he was misbehaving in some way, but I can't fully remember. Yeah. I'm looking for it now too, and I can't find the part, but it's definitely the implication is that he got branded so that people would know that he was like fought, you know, he wasn't yeah. docile. Um, and uh, so, yeah, they're all geared up. And, um, oh my God, I'm just reading this part. No one buys dead mummers. <laughs> and Jura says, or dead dwarfs. <laughs> just... True enough. Uh, 
Um, so let's see. As long as I look prettier than you, I'll be happy. I forgot that he says that to him. Uh, you've got no nose and you can say that and maybe mean it. That's pretty <laughs> rough, Jorah. Um, so eventually when he's talking Tyrion to Penny about like how you have to make a good showing of the fighting and he, this is what I advise from how small you are and how to handle it. She does that thing where she like, I dreamed that my brother was alive again and that we were jousting for a Lord and we were so happy. And this is when he slaps her. Yeah. And she, even though it wasn't particularly hard, starts crying. Yeah. He says, and he says, a dream, go back to sleep. When you, when we wake up, you'll still be escaped slaves. We should have never run. We're not cell swords. We were his favorites. Slaves. The word you want is slaves. We were his special slaves, though. Just like sweets, his treasures. And like I said, I really feel Tyrion should be telling her the truth at this point. Because she clearly really believes this. And I feel like she's one step away from running and going back. And if she were told the truth, maybe she wouldn't believe it. But it's worth a shot. You know, yeah. He says that um, there there's a part where Tyrion's thinking, and he says there has never been a slave who did not choose to be a slave. He reflected, the choice may have been between bondage and death, but the choice is always there. And then he thinks he's thinking about Penny specifically, and he says she has been searching for a new master since the day her brother died. She wants someone to take care of her, someone to tell her what to do. But yeah. it would have been too cruel to say so. So instead, he says, uh, Yazan's special slaves did not escape the pale mare. They're dead, a lot of them. Sweets was the first to go. Um, and that's like his harsh truth to her when it could have been, to your point, the thing about being sent to the pit to be devoured by lions or mm -hmm. the idea of like slaves were chattel and that they could be bought and sold and whipped and brand and used for carnal pleasure and bred to make more slaves um and that in that sense they were no more than dogs or horses um yeah so he's yeah choosing... i did like the reflection on just like people say they'd rather die than be a slave but it's real easy to say that shit and that's why there's so many slaves out there because people don't make that choice most of the time like and the, you know as somebody who uh, also has some self-preservation built in yeah I'll, I'll i'll stay being a slave if t that means staying alive probably you know depending on how bad it is i mean the 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 human what do you call it? The the instinct of self preservation mm -hmm. is, you know, very 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 strong. And the idea that some life is better than no life, you know, really yeah. is how our brains function. Um, now there are plenty of people who do choose death, you know, and have over the past centuries and millennia. Mm -hmm. that you know do choose death instead of being enslaved but for those that don't like people get really like very high and mighty about all that shit i would never be a, you know what i mean yeah that's you, exactly you, what he's referencing yeah, you don't know what the fuck you would do you don't fucking know until you're in that situation and there's a very good chance that you know, there used to be an old, was it Eddie Murphy that made that joke about that? Like an old Eddie Murphy joke from a stand-up routine where people talk real big about like what they would do if they had been slaves. And then like if they were suddenly transported back to that time, how quick they would adjust to the yeah. reality of the situation because of the brutality is because the brutality and the lack of options is almost impossible for us to comprehend in a with a modern context that we simply just cannot wrap our brains around it. You know, like we in our imagination think of all the, it's like when people start talking about like having a revolution and like what that's going to look like on the ground, we, yeah. we forget all of the things that the little things that we take for granted 
that we like that we need to survive and like what would we do if we didn't have those things anymore you mm-hmm. know what could what would you do if you couldn't just go to the right aid or the drugstore and get your script for whatever it is that you need like yeah you know like shit like that <laughs> you know mm-hmm. like we think about like the part to, to go back to the joke you know there's this idea that like you just say no to the slave master and tell him go suck your dick and then you're just gonna walk off walk off and go where though mm-hmm. like where are you going you know there's no safe place for you to just leave and walk to where you're suddenly free from the danger of being caught up and enslaved again like our brains just don't compute <laughs> um yeah although i will say that him being like every slave has made a choice to be a slave was giving like Kanye West for a minute for me. And I know what he means. And I like ultimately agree with the, the actual like thesis here, but it just, for a moment, I was just like, Oh no. Did you remember him saying that? Oh yeah, I do. That's a, yeah, that's a, Mm. it's a fucking rerun. There's always some fucking dude who pops off with some shit like that. Some of them more well known than others, but yeah, yeah. So, uh, eventually, he, like you said, just tells her to fucking get real. Um, and Jora is talking about how, like, the queen is going to return. She must. Um, and. Our side consists of two score Yunkish lordlings, each with his own half-trained monkey men. Slaves on stilts, slaves in chains. They may have troops of blind men and palsied children, too. I would not put it past them. Oh, I know, said Tyrion. The second sons are on the losing side. They need to turn their cloaks again and do it now. He grinned. Leave that to me. <laughs> <laughs> So that is where that ends for him. There's one thing Tyrion's going to have, y'all, is a plan. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a good plan or not remains to be seen. But this 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 dude's going to have a plan. <laughs> nope. So then, the Kingbreaker. Uh, so, this is so... So we start off these names, you guys. I just want to just preface this with how confusing it can be for me because of the names and they're just being unfamiliar and, and similar enough that it's difficult for me to keep people straight in my head. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got Skahaz who is meeting with Barrist and Selmy. Um, and he says the, uh, what was done to him? You were at court? One guardsman amongst 40, all waiting for the empty tabard on the throne to speak the command so we might cut down Bloodbeard and the rest. Do you think the Yunkai would ever have dared present Daenerys with the head of her hostage? No, thought Selmy. Hmm. His star seemed distraught. Sham. His own kin of Lorak were returned unharmed. You saw. The Yunkai played us a mummer's farce with noble Hisdar as chief Mummer. The issue was never Yorkazo Yunzak. The other slavers would gladly have trampled that old fool themselves. This was to give Hisdar a pretext to kill the dragons. Mm-hmm. So is Yorkaz the one whose head got thrown? Grolio is whose head got Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Thrown, yeah. So who's Yorkazo Yunzak? Um... I don't remember. Yeah, see, exactly. this is what yeah. I'm saying. He's um, the um I don't know. I'm, look, I'm, I'm yeah. looking this up on the old internet. A uh Yunkish noble and supreme commander of the armies and allies of Yunkai. Okay. So he's who the young he's who they sort of treated with when they had this exchange of like hostages that we were the Danny and his star had agreed to, right? Oh, it says Yurkaz perishes as he tries to flee the dragon, either having been crushed beneath the feet of his own fleeing slaves and companions, or because his heart burst in terror. 
So that's who they're, they're like allegedly upset about his death, but they're saying like, that's not what the fuck they're actually upset about. Okay. Okay. I'm getting it now. That's why he says the other yeah. slavers would have gladly trampled yeah. that old fool themselves. But, but good, then now they're going to use his death as like a banner. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the, the whole thing here is uh, Selmy, who is getting, it seems to be kind of getting, not that he doesn't believe it himself, but this is him coming along to the line of thinking that his dar is part of this plot to have poisoned Daenerys, steal the crown, and killed her dragons. Right. Okay. And so, yeah, Selmy is listening to all this, and he's just like, would he dare to have even done this? And the guy he's talking to, who is uh, Shakaz, is like, oh, he did this. He dared to kill the queen. Skahaz. Skahaz? Skahaz. Yeah. Skahaz Mokandek. Hmm, that's a name. I'm saying um, she did. She dared to kill the queen. Why not her pets? If we don't act now, Hisdar will hesitate for a time to try to give proof of his reluct- reluctance. But he absolutely will act, and they're going to want the dragons dead before the Valentine fleet arrives. So we need to do whatever it is we're plotting. We need to do it now. Yeah. And it turns out what the plot is, is to take the king hostage for crimes against the queen. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think about this accusation? Because I am feeling like he is too obvious. Well, I mean, I think we talked about this a little bit when it first happened with the locusts and shortly thereafter, the idea that uh, it seems very... It seems um, now at this point in the book, it almost seems like he's getting set up. Yeah, agree. But if you were going to ask me, but who do I think is behind it? I mean, this whole plot line, y'all, is so convoluted (laughs) and filled with people I don't know who have, to your point, names that are difficult to keep clear and we spend like time with them and then we're gone for such a long time that when we come back, I'm just like, wait, who, who's this mm-hmm. now? Who's so-and-so? So I don't, I mean, it could very well be like you have the city of Marine and then you have the young Kai and then uh, the people from Astapor. Um, we have so many in another city whose name escapes me. Um, we have so many people to stand to gain by getting rid of both Daenerys and her king, you know, that Mm -hmm. it does not seem out of the realm of possibility that this, this guy who I don't even like that much, but his daughter is like kind of getting set up here. Um, But yeah, but, 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 but who's behind it actually, like, I feel like there's lots of suspects. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I feel like um, later on, Selmy says a couple of times to Hisdar, like, you urged the queen to taste the locusts. Mm-hmm. And I, like, no, he didn't. He, one time when she was like, what are those? He's like, oh, you should try those. They're really good. And that was the end of it. It was only the one and time? And he never attempts again. No. And so for me, I'm like, if she were, be like, if he had poisoned them, don't you think he would have given it more of a try? Don't you think he would have picked them up and brought I, them over? Don't you think he would have done something more than that? Like, I'm going to have to absolutely take your word for it because my memory is my memory. And I could have swore he said it at least twice, but even two times is not like damning. But I thought he yeah. said, I thought he said it at least more than one time. I may be wrong, but I feel like I was like paying attention to it on this read because I knew about the fate of uh, Strong Bellwas and that he was going to get sick from it. And I I could swear that he only suggests the one time. But, you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. But <laughs> yeah, I just feel like I understand why Barristan 
thinks this, but for me, it just feels very thin and it's just because the pieces fit together otherwise so easily that he's like, okay, well, it all makes sense. And I'm like, yeah, but it's all, it's all so right there. Mm. Right. You know, like, don't you think that's a little bit suspicious? <laughs> well, Let's I see. mean, if it is um, a plan, I'm going it's... to this spot. So, uh, strong bellus bellowed locusts and seized the bowl and began to crunch them by the handful. Those are very tasty, advised his daughter. You ought to try a few yourself, my love. They're rolled in a spice before the honey, so they are sweet and hot at once. That explains why the way Belwas is sweating, Danny said. I believe I will content myself with figs and dates. And I'm like going quickly through the rest of this. And yeah, never says it again. Mm. Nope. Nope, not brought up again. I think maybe because Belwas just eats them. House them. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's why. What if they were there for him and not for her? Did we talk about that? For Belwas? For for his daughter. Oh, because they knew he liked them? That's interesting. Maybe they were trying to frame Danny. Maybe set her up for like poisoning her king and have a reason to take her out and call her false. And I don't know. I don't know, guys. This whole plot is so convoluted. I yeah. I, I really can't get too deep into the weeds because I'll get so turned around. So. Um. Anyway, so the the my my theory is that it is her like advisor but i don't know i don't know so let's jump ahead here a little bit um the king's protectors grew fewer every day his star's blunder with gray worm had cost him the unsullied when his grace had tried to put them under the command of a cousin as he had the brazen beasts gray worm had informed the king they were free men who took commands only from their mother sucks to suck <laughs> uh and then let's see um bellico bonebreaker and gogor the giant might serve as his star shields but the notion of either leading an army into battle was so ludicrous that the knight almost smiled i am his graces to command not grace the seneschal mm -hmm. complained that style is westerosi his magnificence his radiance his worship. I, the, this, this like complaint that comes up a lot like later mm -hmm. as well is very, very funny to me. I just can't get over how grace and, and hi highness, I guess, aren't enough. Like, or your majesty, like why is, radiance better than majesty i mean listen <laughs> i don't see it when i feel it, like they're both when it just comes, very good when it comes to like cultural norms there's i don't know if it's necessarily one is better than the other i mean clearly they take offense at the 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 refusal to adhere to their cultural norms mm -hmm. so i take it as that and not necessarily that the word isn't good enough but that it's sort of an insult that you are i have told you what i am to be called and your insistence on a, on addressing me using your cultural norms is what is disrespectful mm, i not, see that i see know. that okay yeah that's fair um but anyway, so that that was that was a, not a quote from this chapter. That was like right near where another mention mm -hmm. of the locusts were, because I was just like scrolling yeah. through a bunch of them. But from the but it's search, funny that but... it comes up because when he rouses the king up later in this chapter and brings him out of bed, he's like, "I'm sorry to wake you, your grace," and he's like, "Magnificent." <laughs> oh, <dare> <laughs> um. 
So they have an argument. Him and Scott has have different ideas on the way they should handle this thing. Gray Worm and the Unsullied will close and bar the gates at first light. Better to attack at first light. No, there is a peace signed and sealed by Her Grace the Queen. We will not be the first to break it. Your way is dishonorable. Your way is stupid, mm-hmm. the shape face said. The hour is ripe. Our freedmen are ready, hungry. That much was true, Selmy knew. Simon's stripe back of the free brothers and Molono Yost Daub of the stalwart shields were both eager for battle, intent on proving themselves and washing out all the wrongs they had suffered in a tide of yonkish blood. Mm. Only Marcelin of the Mother's Men shared Sir Barristan's doubts. I just want to, again, take a moment here and point out all of these names mean absolutely nothing to me. <laughs> I don't remember them ever being mentioned. They may have been, but they sure didn't make an impression. And as of right now, you could have literally invented those on the spot and I would not know. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to tell. So, um, so... Barrison's like, I'm going to go deal with Kraz, but don't make sure I don't have to deal with the brazen beasts as well. Have no fear. We still have Margaz in chains, uh, or we will have Margaz in chains before he can make mischief. I told you the brazen beasts are mine. You have men among the Yunkishmen, sneaks and spies. Resnak has more. Resnak cannot be trusted. He smells too sweet and feels too foul. And Resnak is the advisor that you were saying earlier that you think might have could possibly be behind it yeah right i couldn't think of his name when you were talking about him but that's who that is and apparently selmy feels the same way Hmm. but he's not thinking enough the same way to like really respect him which is very frustrating I'm, i'm sorry he's not thinking that he's necessarily the culprit but he's thinking that he's not completely trustworthy yeah um i just want him to take it like another step you know but I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Um, so then they have a talk about like the fact that they each have hostages. And of course, Scott has is like, well, then let's kill a fucking hostage. Let's give him a head back. And he's like, the hostages are children and we are not killing them. And Scott has understandably is like, the fuck is the point of them then? Why take hostages yeah. if you're never going to do anything with them? Which that's very, they are calling her bluff mm-hmm. by sending a head because they know that she fucking won't. And he actually and, says to Selmy, like, you're worried about the hostages of ours that they have. Would you really miss them that much? And it gives me, a, was, I was very grateful for the reminder of who had been, you know, taken hostage. Mm-hmm. And it's um, Jogo, Dario, and Hero, um, a eunuch, a savage, and a sellsword. And um, Selmy has to remind uh, this guy that um, you're going to have to put some respect on these three names mm-hmm. because Jogo is uh, the queen's blood rider, blood of her blood. Hero is Grey Worm, second in fucking command. Well, and Dario, and then he sort of trails <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> that cracked me up eventually he's like well what would you say to daenerys if dario dies and scott has is like i tell her we're super sorry and he died super bravely and she'd be very sad and then she'd get the fuck over it is what Listen. would happen it's fine he also reminds so me that dario calls you sir grandfather so why are you going so hard for protecting this <laughs> motherfucker's head <laughs> Like trying to, you know, if, maybe if I hit him with the shade a little bit, remind him that you don't even mm-hmm. fuck with this dude. That'll like loosen him up a little bit for the, you know, for the conversation. But Selmy is Selmy, and you know his idea of honor is like not flexible. flexible. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So i'm trying to yeah he even thinks like if he did die it would be better for westeros and he thinks of all of the different times that people making bad marriages really Mm -hmm. fucked people over and is like uh yeah Yeah. and like i think as a queen she knows that he's not good news but he you know she's also a girl and that is going to influence her there's uh just some reality to what she is there yeah and this, um, this little jaunt down memory lane, which I'm sure is like 
I should be like some of it. I some of it I recognize, obviously, like Rhaegar and uh, Lady uh, Leanna, and then there's like talk of Damon Blackfire and the first Daenerys and um, Bitter Steel and Blood Raven, and so some of this, you know, I've learned over the course of like people talking and some of it from House of Dragon, and then just some basic Song of Ice and Fire lore that people have shared mm-hmm. all across the internets, and then. Um, some things that I feel like I I was told but don't remember, like the Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstone so much that he cast aside a crown, and Westeros pay, paid the bride price for that. Uh, that one I feel like God, I know somebody told me about that. I know you probably told me about that, but I just there's a song that gets sung about Jenny of Oldstones a bunch of times, but oh, okay. I don't know how much we've been told the exact story. Gotcha, but uh. So yeah, but I appreciated that little like bit of memory for for Selmy. And that's where a lot of this chapter ends up going. Like not to like rush us or anything, but you know, eventually <laughs> they just go grab this dude out of his bed. Mm-hmm. Who and he and he is not a bed alone by the way, you know. Nah. He's got um, a bed slave. Uh, got- excuse me, a <laughs> sex worker. He's like correcting himself. Like, oh, right, right, right. We can't say slave no more, even though that's like pretty much what's going on. Uh, but what we do get is uh, some sell me recollections mm-hmm. um, and some great regret that he has. Uh, and yeah. it goes back to that tournament at Heron Hall where like all roads lead to this moment from so many different people that we have met it's so it's i mean i know it's not like earth shattering to people who've been reading the books but it just continues to catch me off guard where i'm like we're back at this moment again Mm -hmm. with a different person again like this was just such a because everybody was there everybody was there it was right this was like a canon event like everybody Mm -hmm. was there and so Selmy is like ruining the fact that he didn't unseat Rhaegar because in his mind, if he had done that, then that would have a taken the opportunity for Rhaegar to give the fucking, whatever you call it, the name, the queen of whatever. Love and beauty. Yeah. So that, that is, I can't even remember myself to say it. It's so silly. It is very it's silly. It's very silly. But like he wouldn't have been able to give it to Leanna. And then if Somi had won, he would have given it to Ashara Dane. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that he had quite the big feelings for her. But of course, could never say them or announce them because as a King's Guard, he had already taken an oath to celibacy and like there was no life that he could be with her. So this is other thing that's throughout these books are these these men harboring lifelong crushes yeah over women that they didn't get to have for whatever reason and then the fucking just absolute fuck shit that they get into because they didn't get the girl that they wanted that's a lot of what's going on in this entire series it's true and there's Ashara a- Dean too. I want to remind you is the woman that a lot of people believe Ned Stark had a thing for. I was just going to mention that because he talks okay, about yeah. he talks about uh, she had danced. Um, where is it? She danced with like three people that night. Uh, the memory was still bitter. Um, his choice would have been a young maiden not long a court. Even after all these years, he could still recall Ashara's smile, the way she looked, her purple eyes. He says Daenerys has the same eyes. Um, Daenerys is definitely, this is a side question. Daenerys's parentage is never in question in these books, right? No. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because when people start talking about people looking like other people and having their same eyes, my little oh, my little brain right. starts to be like, "Wait, wait, what's happening? <laughs> what's happening?" No, no, no. As far as I know, anyway, I'm sure some there are some quacks out there who think, but uh, I can't find the part yet about what dancing at Heron Hall, but I know it's in here, so I guess we'll get to it in a second. Okay. Um. So 
let's see. Uh, we we have jumped ahead a little bit, but there's a, a th- like before he actually gets to the bedroom, he is thinking about these boys that he has been training and whether or not to make them knights because some of them are like quite skilled. And he decides that like if this shit goes bad and I am tr- like accused of treason they can't be knights that were knighted by a treason a traitor a treason maker you know mm, that's what mm-hmm. they say the treason maker um <laughs> king breaker treason maker mm. uh so he decides that yeah i'm gonna hold off on that he runs into miss sandy and is just like uh you want to get out of here and she's like well can i just ask nope nope <laughs> probably shouldn't um and there's when he's talking about Ashara, Ashara's daughter had been stillborn and his fair lady had thrown herself from a tower soon after mad with grief for the child she had lost and perhaps for the man who had dishonored her at Heron Hall instead, which many people theorize was Ned's brother, Brandon Stark. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Mm. Yeah. He and was dis- a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a dog. And dishonored, so. I'm ass- I'm assuming, is a euphemism for like taking her maidenhood and not making her a, a lady, mm-hmm. mm. not marrying her. Yeah. And Brandon is the one who was engaged to Cat before he died, right? Correct. Okay. Um. So. Sorry, I'm trying to because we did jump ahead quite a bit and there's like pages and pages before he gets to the bedroom, but it's so much of it is just sort of like reflecting on things and ob- observations of the kinds of armor of, on the people that he's passing. Like a lot of it just doesn't feel necessarily like it's important. I say necessarily because it may be yeah. and we just don't know that yet, but you know, as of right now. Um, here it is. <laughs> uh, he, when he gets down to the room, the brazen beasts are wearing masks of locusts, which I was like, oh, nice. <laughs> I see what you're doing there. Um, I have more locusts if you need them, said Skahaz. Six should serve. What of the men on the doors? Mine. You will have no trouble. Shed no blood if you must. Come the morrow, we will convene a council and tell the city what we've done and why. So they go to their separate ways. And then we have the interruption at, at like, he's clearly finished having sex with this woman and fallen asleep. And Barristan basically is just accusing him outright. So did you poison her? (laughs) <laughs> and his star genuinely seems totally flabbergasted says, that this is even a question. He says, his star says, I had a dream you found Daenerys. And so he is like, dreams can lie. Your grace. That's the first time he calls them your grace. And then he's just like, are you the harpy? Yep. Just, I'm here to ask a question. Magnificence. Are you the heart? Yep. I love that he calls him magnificence when he asks him if he's a harpy. And then we get um, a lot of sputtering. How dare you? Why would you say such a thing? Are you mad? You've come to my bedchamber in the middle of the night to to speak these indignities. It's a it's a big show. As he is like backing away, inch by inch. <laughs> now here is my question is like do we think that the person who poisoned Daenerys is necessarily also the harpy because I would be willing to bet he is the harpy but just not that he poisoned Daenerys that's a very good point I mean Selby makes some solid arguments for being a harpy because one of the things he says is when you basically told them to stand down when you announced that like people needed to stand down, however that went, they listened to you. Why would they yeah. listen to you if you weren't a harpy? Uh, but his dar stays laser Adamant. focused on the poison aspect and just denies, yeah. like denies everything else. Um, he says something else too. He says, um, 
first he blames the, the Dornish people. He was like, it was it was that Dornish man who 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 poisoned her with the locust. And then he says, um, I hot spices don't agree with me. She was my wife, my queen. Why would I want to poison her? And sell me is like, why is this motherfucker talking in past tense? Hmm. He believes she's dead already. And so he says it again, only you can answer that magnificent. It might be that you wish to put another woman in her place with a little sly nod to like the person in the in the fucking bedroom. And that's mm-hmm. when he is like, uh you know, she's that's that's nobody. She's she's nothing, nothing but a slave. Oh, my bad. A free woman. <laughs> um and then some is like, I heard you urge the queen to try those locusts. I heard you'd say it. And he's like, I just thought she might think they were tasty, hot and sweet at <laughs> once. <laughs> I know this isn't supposed to be funny, but for some reason, I just was incredibly tickled by the whole thing. I cannot explain why. I just was. Just he's just like, you know, I wanted her to have a little snack. We were. <laughs> <laughs> And as someone who also likes to offer people a little snacky snack, I was just like, oh, this was terrible. If he didn't do it, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does suck. Yeah, because I really, I don't know. I just I just don't think. I just don't. I don't know. It just feels too obvious. And jo- you know how George is. He's a twisty-minded little man. Yeah, it's true. It's so. true. And so the part that Selmy's talking about, I heard you giving orders, is I heard you commanding the men in the pit to kill Drogon, shouting at them. And his daughter is like, well, yeah, the beast was devouring flesh, like dragons prey on men. It was it was killing and burning as we watched. And Selmy is like, yeah, burning the men who meant harm to the queen, though. Like, they weren't your friends. They were mm-hmm. they were harming, you know, people who had risen up in defiance, not your fucking friends. And his daughter's like, Yeah, 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 not my friends. But 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 somebody's like, Yeah, yeah, you say that, but when you told them to stop, they obeyed you. Why would they do that if you were not one of them? And he doesn't have an answer. His daughter doesn't even he doesn't even speak. That one I feel like is hitting the mark. Mm-hmm. I think that he's got something there with that. Yeah. And I mean, you could argue that like I made them, I, I told them to stop him because even though they weren't my friends, this dragon was fucking out of control and could easily have then come at us, which I would be willing to like maybe accept. But mm-hmm. the fact that he reacts the way he does to the rest of the questions makes me think. Yeah. Mm, I want right about you and and Selmy doesn't like continue to hammer on this point that shut his door kind of up in the moment which I kind of wish he should have but what he does instead is he's like look just tell me the truth did you even ever love her which is not the point like I, don't I thought know, that was a weird question right why are we segueing why are we of course he didn't love her that's not the point of any of this what exactly. are you even asking for I thought I, I agree I thought the same thing like this is a weird question this isn't important so now his dar gets to be like self-righteous again and be indignant. How dare you talk about lust to me? You speak to me of lust? And he gets all mad. And he's like, yeah, I wanted the crown, but not as much as she wanted her cell sword. Perhaps it was her precious captain who tried to poison her for putting him aside. Now, I don't <laughs> think that's a thing. But I sense a butt coming. I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say I don't think it's a thing. Um, but it, it's a very good deflection. And yeah. I don't like that Selmy even gave him an opportunity for this deflection by bringing this up. Yeah. Because now this we're is, talking about Dario. <laughs> this is a major issue for me in a lot of scenes where people finally confront each other. They do not actually make the person answer the question that they're there for and allow this like kind of change of topic. And I watch it happen and get so irritated by how little effort it took to throw them off the scent of the original issue. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and this happens also in places like Congress, for example. Uh Oh, um, trenchant. 
<laughs> but yeah, it's just really, really frustrating because like you said, I don't feel that whether he loved her is at all relevant. Like you don't have to love your spouse to not be the one who murdered them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, it, it just, there's plenty of reasons to accuse him, but bringing that up here just makes him seem like a child in some ways, you know? Yeah. Like, um, like we're going for, we're going for like trying to judge his star as whether or not he's capable of killing Daenerys based on whether or not he truly ever loved her. Right. And like that's, and, and if he says he really did love her, that that somehow will be proof of his innocence. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with anything. Also, I never thought that him loving her was believed by anybody. Exactly. That was part of my puzzlement as well. It's like, why are you asking like you thought that was ever true or that he was pretending that like mm -hmm. they'll say my love for you you know but it's all it's a figure of speech and we all know that's what it is it's just i don't know the whole thing feels weird so finally his dar yells for kraz who is his uh bodyguard and he comes out with his arak and Barrison's like, leave this alone and I won't hurt you. <laughs> and Kras says, old man, I will eat your heart. Man, listen, you don't know who you are talking to right now. He doesn't. He really doesn't. Like, these people don't know who they're dealing with. They they are fooled because he's an older man. They they mm -mm. they don't know about Sir Barrison Selman. <laughs> The pit fighter was fast, blazing fast, as quick as any man Sir Barristan had ever fought. In those big hands, the Iraq became a whistling blur, a steel storm that seemed to come at the old knight from three directions at once. Most of the cuts were aimed at his head. Kraz was no fool. Without a helm, Selmy was most vulnerable above the neck. And I love that he thinks this is what I was made for. The dance, the sweet steel song, a sword in my hand, and a foe before me. For the first time all day, Selmy felt certain. <laughs> so he blocks and retreats. He sees a cupbearer watching. Uh, Kraz cursed and turned a high cut into a low one, slipping past the old knight's blade for once, only to have his blow scrape uselessly off a white steel greave. Selmy's answering slash found the pit fighter's left shoulder, parting the fine linen to bite the flesh beneath. His yellow tunic began to turn pink, then red. So now Kraz starts being like, oh, if you're in armor. Well, that's just a fucking cowardly move. I'm out here just in my gym jams. And I feel like if you want this to be a fair fight, you will also change into your PJ, sir. And uh, I, what he says, you're a coward. This coward is about to kill you, sir. <laughs> uh, Kras did not know how to fight a man in armor. Sir Barristan could see it in his eyes. Doubt, confusion, the beginnings of fear. The pit fighter came on again, screaming this time, as if sound could slay his foe where steel could not. Selmy blocked the cuts at his head and let his armor stop the rest, whilst his own blade opened the pit fighter's cheek from ear to mouth, then traced a raw red gash across his chest. And he just gets a little bit more bonkers at this point. In the pit, that uh, that would have taken your arm off. We are not in the pit. Take off that armor! It is not too late to throw down your, sh your steel. Yield. Die, spat Kraz. But as he lifted his arrack, its tip grazed one of the wall hangings and hung. That was all the chance Sir Barristan required. Mm. That is so embarrassing. It really is. <laughs> oh my god. It's not even just that you lost because, you know, you tired yourself out or you were dealing with it, but like you just misjudged how far back the wall hangings were <laughs> for a second. Like, oh, that sucks. So yeah. He kills him. <laughs> um, 
And there's the girl, Keza, and he tells her, I mean you no harm. I want only the king. And his star is crying and hiding behind a curtain. Oh, my God. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> Spare me, he begged. I do not want to die. Few do. <laughs> Yet all men die regardless. But he doesn't kill him. He takes him to a cell. And he's just like, I don't know what the fuck to think about what I'm doing. I better be right about this. <laughs> uh, so, as, uh, let's see. They... Oh, I'm sorry. oh, go ahead. I was just going to no, say, you go ahead. I love this, that as, as this is happening, at the beginning of this whole encounter with his daughter, when he first comes out of his bedroom and sees Somi, he's like, he sends... Um, two people out for wine mm -hmm. and so he's got his star like i promises that you won't kill him because you know my word is a knight and then they come back with the wine but like it's like that donald glover gif when you come back yes. to the room and everything is and on, everything fire. on fire <laughs> indeed indeed yep that exact thing <laughs> um your worship miklas said the noble resnak mo resnak says to tell you come at once the boy addressed the king as if Sir Barristan were not there, as if there were no dead man sprawled upon the carpet. Skahaz was supposed to take Resnak into custody until we could be certain of his loyalty. Had something gone awry? Come where? Sir Barristan asked the boy. Where does the Seneschal want his grace to go? Outside. Outside, sir, to the terrace to, to see. To see what? D d dragons. The dragons have been loosed, sir. Seven save us all, the old knight thought. So, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> all right, I'm going to read you the next chapter live. I was debating whether to do it. We have only, we, we've got the time. I, well, hmm. I don't know, man. I don't know. We've got, we've done an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, it's about 3.15 my time. Do we have time? Are you willing? I have to be done by, in order to, to do what I need to do to be ready for my appointment, I have to be done by four. So we have 45 minutes. Okay. I'm going to do it. Okay. I'm just going to go for it. So let's do this. <laughs> Next chapter is titled The Dragon Tamer. The night crept past on slow black feet. The hour of the bat gave way to the hour of the eel. The hour of the eel to the hour of ghosts. I desperately want to know what times these are. By the way. I know too, right? <laughs> and I've been meaning for ages to ask you to look that up for me. And I always forget to do I it. I keep forgetting. The prince lay abed, staring at his ceiling, dreaming without sleeping, remembering, imagining, twisting beneath his linen coverlet, his mind feverish with the thoughts of fire and blood. Finally, despairing of rest, Quentin Martell made his way down to the solar where he poured himself a cup of wine and drank it in the dark. The taste was sweet solace on his tongue, so he lit a candle and poured himself another. Wine will help me sleep, he told himself, but he knew that was a lie. He stared at the candle for a long time, then put down his cup and held his palm above the flame. It took every bit of will he had to lower it until the fire touched his flesh, and when it did, he snatched his hand back with a cry of pain. Quentin, are you mad? No, just scared. I do not want to burn. Garrus, I heard you moving about. I could not sleep. Are burns a cure for that? Some warm milk and a lullaby might serve you well, or better still, I could take you to the Temple of Graces and find a girl for you. A whore, you mean? They call them graces. They come in different colors. The red ones are the only ones who fuck. Garrus seated himself across the table. The septas back home should take up the custom, if you ask me. Have you noticed that old septas always look like prunes? That's what a life of chastity will do to you. <laughs> Quentin glanced out at the terrace where night's shadow lay thick among the trees. He could hear the soft sound of falling water. Is that rain? Your horrors will be gone. 
Not all of them. There are little snuggeries in the pleasure gardens, and they wait there every night till a man chooses them. Those who are not chosen must remain until the sun comes up feeling lonely and neglected. We could console them. <laughs> they could console me, is what you mean. That too. That is not the sort of consolation I require. I disagree. <laughs> Daenerys Targaryen is not the only woman in the world. Do you want to die a man-made? Quentin did not want to die at all. I want to go back to Ironwood and kiss both of your sisters, marry Gwyneth Ironwood, watch her flower into beauty, have a child by her. I want to ride in tourneys, hawk and hunt, visit with my mother in Norvos, read some of those books my father sends me. I want Cletus and Will and Maester Kedry to be alive again. Do you think Daenerys would be pleased to hear that I have bedded some whore? She might be. Men may be fond of maidens, but women like a man who knows what he's about in the bedchamber. Huh. It's another sort of swordplay. Takes training to be good at it. The jibes stung. Quentin had never felt so much a boy as when he'd stood before Daenerys Targaryen pleading for her hand. The thought of betting her terrified him almost as much as her dragons had. What if he could not please her? Daenerys has a par paramour, he said defensively. My father did not send me here to amuse the queen in the bedchamber. You know why we have come. You cannot marry her. She has a husband. She does not love his Darza Lorak. What has love to do with marriage? A prince should know better. Your father married for love. It said how much joy has he had of that? Little mm. and less. Doran Martell and his Norvoshi wife had spent half their marriage apart and the other half arguing. It was the only rash thing his father had ever done, to hear some tell it. The only time he had followed his heart instead of his head, and he had lived to rue it. Oh, no. Not all li risks lead to ruin, he insisted. This is my duty, my destiny. You are supposed to be my friend, Garrus. Why must you mock my hopes? I have doubts enough without you throwing oil on the fire of my fear. This will be a grand adventure. Men die on great adventures. He was not wrong. That was in the stories, too. The hero sets out with his friends and companions, faces dangers, comes home triumphant. Only some of his companions don't return at all. The hero never dies, though. I must be the hero. All I need is courage. Would you have Dorne remember me as a failure? Dorne is not like to remember any of us for long. Quentin sucked at the burn spot on his palm. Dorne remembers Aegon and his sisters. Dragons are not so easily forgotten. They will remember Daenerys as well. Not if she's died. She lives. She must. She is lost, but I can find her. And when I do, she will look at me the way she looked at her sellsword, once I've proven myself worthy of her. From Dragonback. I've been riding horses since I was six years old. And you've been thrown a time or three. <laughs> that never stopped me from getting back into the saddle. You've never been thrown off a thousand feet above the ground, Garrus pointed out. And horses seldom turn their riders into charred bones and ashes. I know the dangers. I'll hear no more of this. You have my leave to go. Find a ship and run home, Garrus. The prince rose, blew the candle out, and crept back to his bed and its sweat-soaked linen sheets. I should have kissed one of the drink water twins, or maybe both of them. I should have kissed them whilst I could. I should have gone to Norvos to see my mother and the place that gave her birth, so she would know that I had not forgotten her. He could hear the rain falling outside, drumming against the bricks. By the time the hour of the wolf crept upon them, the rain was falling steadily, slashing down in a hard, cold torrent that would soon turn the brick streets of Marine into rivers. The three Dornishmen broke their fast in the pre-dawn chill, a simple meal of fruit and bread and cheese washed down with goat milk. When Garrus made to pour himself a cup of wine, Quentin stopped him. No wine. There'll be time enough to drink afterward. One hopes, said Garrus. <laughs> the big man looked out toward the terrace. I knew it would rain, he said in a gloomy tone. My bones were aching last night. They always ache before it rains. The dragons won't like this. Fire and water don't mix. That's a fact. You get a good cook fire lit, blazing away nice, then it starts to piss down rain, and next thing your wood is sodden and your flames are dead. Garrus chuckled. Dragons are not made of wood, Arch. Some are. 
That old King Aegon, the randy one, he built wooden dragons to conquer us. That ended bad, though. So may this, the prince thought. The follies and failures of Aegon the Unworthy did not concern him, but he was full of doubts and misgivings. The labored banter of his friends was only making his head ache. They do not understand. They may be Dornish, but I am Dorn. Years from now, when I am dead, this will be the song they sing of me. He rose abruptly. It's time. His friends got to their feet. Sir Archibald drained the last of his goat's milk and wiped the milk mustache from his upper lip with the back of a big hand. I'll get our mummer's garb. He returned with the bundle they'd collected from the tattered prince at their second meeting. Within were three long hooded cloaks made from myriad small squares of cloth sewn together, three cudgels, three short swords, three masks of polished brass, a bull, a lion, and an ape, everything required to be a brazen beast. They may ask for a word, the tattered prince had warned them when he handed over the bundle. It's dog. You are certain of that? Garrus had asked him. Certain enough to wager a life upon it? The prince did not mistake his meaning. My life. That would be the one. Hmm. How did you learn their word? We chanced upon some brazen beasts and Marist asked them prettily. But a prince should know better than to pose such questions, Dornish. In Pentos, we have a saying, never ask the baker what went into the pie. Just eat. Just eat. There was wisdom in that, Quentin supposed. I'll be the bull, Arch announced. Quentin handed him the bull mask. The lion for me, which makes a monkey out of me. <laughs> Garrus pressed the ape mask to his face. How do they breathe in these things? Just put it on. The prince was in no mood for japes. The bundle contained a whip as well, a nasty piece of old leather with a handle of brass and bone, stout enough to peel the hide off an ox. What's that for? Arch asked. Daenerys used a whip to cow the black beast. Quentin coiled the whip and hung it from his belt. Arch, bring your hammer as well. We may have need of it. It was no easy thing to enter the Great Pyramid of Meereen by night. The doors were closed and barred each day at sunset and remained closed until first light. Guards were posted at every entrance, and more guards patrolled the lowest terrace where they could look down on the street. Formerly, those guards had been unsullied. Now, they were brazen beasts, and that would make all the difference, Quentin hoped. The watch changed when the sun came up, but dawn was still half an hour off as the three Dornishmen made their way down the servant's steps. The walls around them were made of bricks of half a hundred colors, but the shadows turned them all to gray until touched by the light of the torch that Garrus carried. They encountered no one on the long descent. The only sound was the scuff of their boots on the worn bricks beneath their feet. The pyramid's main gates conf uh, fronted on Marine Central Plaza, but the Dornishmen made their way to a side entrance opening on an alley. These were the gates that slaves had used in former days as they went about their master's business, where small folk and tradesmen came and went and made their deliveries. The doors were solid bronze, closed with a heavy iron bar, before them stood two brazen beasts, armed with cudgels, spears, and short swords. Torchlight glimmered off the polished brass of their masks, a rat and a fox. Quentin gestured for the big man to stay back in the shadows. He and Garrus strode forward together. You come early, the fox said. Quentin shrugged. We can leave again if you'd like. You're welcome to stand our watch. He sounded not at all Gascari, he knew, but half the brazen beasts were freed slaves with all manner of native tongues, so his accent went unremarked. Bugger that, the rat remarked. Give us the day's word, said the fox. Dog, said the Dornishman. The two brazen beasts exchanged a look. For three long heartbeats, Quentin was afraid that something had gone amiss, that somehow Pretty Maris and the Tattered Prince had gotten the wrong word. Then the fox grunted. Dog, then, he said. The door is yours. As they moved off, the prince began to breathe again. Hmm. They did not have long. The real relief would doubtless turn up shortly. Arch, he called, and the big man appeared, the torchlight shining off his bull's mask. The bar hurry. The iron bar was thick and heavy, but well oiled. Sir Archibald had no trouble lifting it. As he was standing it on end, Quentin pulled the doors open and Garrus stepped through, waving the torch. Bring it in now. Be quick about it. 
The butcher's wagon was outside waiting in the alley. The driver gave the mule a lick and rumbled through, iron-rimmed wheels clacking loudly over bricks. The quartered carcass of an ox filled the wagon bed, along with two dead sheep. Half a dozen men entered afoot. Five wore the cloaks and masks of brazen beasts, but pretty Maris had not troubled to disguise herself. "'Where's your lord?' he asked Maris. "'I have no lord,' she answered. "'If you mean your fellow prince, he is near with fifty men. "'Bring your dragon out, and he will see you safe away as promised. "'Cago commands here.' "'Sir Archibald was giving the butcher's wagon the sour eye. "'Will that cart be big enough to hold a dragon?' he asked. "'Should, it's held two oxen.' My God. "'The corpse killer was garbed as a brazen beast.' his seamed, scarred face hidden behind a cobra mask, but the familiar black arrack slung at his hip gave him away. We were told these beasts are smaller than the queen's monster. The pit has slowed their growth. Quentin's reading had suggested the same thing occurred in the Seven Kingdoms. None of the dragons bred and raised in the dragon pit of King's Landing had ever approached the size of Vagar or Meraxes, much less that of the Black Dread. King Aegon's monster. Have you brought sufficient chains? How many dragons do you have? said pretty Maris. We have chains enough for ten, concealed beneath the mead. Very good. Quentin felt lightheaded. None of this seemed quite real. One moment it felt like a game, the next like some nightmare, like a bad dream, where he found himself opening a dark door knowing that horror and death waited on the other side yet somehow powerless to stop himself. His palms were slick with sweat. He wiped them on his leg and said, there will be more guards just outside the pit. We know, said Garrus. Mm -hmm. We need to be ready for them. We are, said Arch. There was a cramp in Quentin's belly. He felt a sudden need to move his bowels, but knew he dare not beg off now. This way then. He had seldom felt more like a boy, yet they followed. Garrus and the big man, Maris and Kago and the other windblown. Two of the sellswords had produced crossbows from some hiding place within the wagon. Beyond the stables, the ground level of the Great Pyramid became a labyrinth, but Quentin Martell had been through there with the queen and remembered the way. Under three huge bricks, brick arches, they went, then down a steep stone ramp into the depths, through the dungeons and torture chambers, and past a pair of deep stone cisterns. Their footsteps echoed hollowly off the walls, the butcher's cart rumbling behind them. The big man snatched a torch down from a wall sconce to lead the way. At last, a pair of heavy iron doors rose before them, rust-eaten and forbidding, closed with a length of chain whose every link was as thick around as a man's arm. The size and thickness of those doors was enough to make Quentin Martell question the wisdom of this course. <laughs> Even worse, both doors were plainly dinted by something inside trying to get out. The thick iron was cracked and splitting in three places, and the upper corner of the left-hand door looked partly melted. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but, like... It's like a fucking cartoon. Like every blinking <laughs> light is like, you know, abort, abort, <laughs> go away. <laughs> Four brazen beasts stood guarding the door. Three held long spears. The fourth, the sergeant, was armed with a short sword and dagger. His mask was wrought in the shape of a basilisk's head. The other three were masked as insects. Locusts, Quentin realized. Dog, he said. The sergeant stiffened. That was all it took for Quentin Martell to realize something had gone awry. Take them, he croaked, even as the basilisk's hand darted for his short sword. He was quick, that sergeant. The big man was quicker. He flung the torch at the nearest locust, reached back, and unslung the warhammer. The basilisk's, basilisk's blade had scarce slipped from its leather sheath when the hammer's spike slammed into his temple, crunching through the thin brass of his mask and the flesh and bone beneath. The sergeant staggered sideways half a step before his knees folded under him, and he sank down to the floor, his whole body shaking grotesquely. Quentin stared, transfixed, his belly roiling. His own blade was still in its sheath. He had not so much as reached for it. 
His eyes were locked on the sergeant dying before him, jerking. The fallen torch was on the floor, guttering, making every shadow leap and twist in a monstrous mockery of the dead man's shaking. The prince never saw the locust spear coming toward him until Garrus slammed into him, knocking him aside. The spear point grazed the cheek of the lion's head he wore. Even, the, the, even then, the blow was so violent it almost tore the mask off. It would have gone right through my throat, the prince thought, dazed. Garrus cursed as the locusts closed around him. Quentin heard the sound of running feet. Then the sellswords came rushing from the shadows. One of the guards glanced at them just long enough for Garrus to get inside his spear. He drove the point of his sword under the brass mask and up through the wearer's throat, even as the second locust sprouted a crossbow bolt from his chest. The last locust dropped his spear. Yield! I yield! No, you die. Kago took the man's head off with one swipe of his arrow, the Valyrian steel shearing through flesh and bone and gristle as if they were so much suet. Too much noise, he complained. Any man with ears will have heard. Dog, Quentin said. The day's word was supposed to be dog. Why wouldn't they let us pass? We were told. You were told your scheme was madness. Have you forgotten? Said Pretty Maris. Do what you came to do. <laughs> the dragons, Prince Quentin thought. Yes, we came for the dragons. He felt as though he might be sick. What am I doing here? Father, why? Four men dead in as many heartbeats, and for what? Fire and blood, he whispered. F blood and fire. The blood was pooling at his feet, soaking into the brick floor. The fire was beyond those doors. The chains, we have no key. Arch said, I have the key. He swung his warhammer hard and fast. Sparks flew when the hammerhead struck the lock, and then again, again, again. On his fifth swing, the lock shattered and the chains fell away in a rattling clatter so loud that Quentin was certain half the pyramid must have heard them. Bring the cart. The dragons would be more docile once fed. Let them gorge themselves on charred mutton. Archibald Ironwood grasped the iron doors and pulled them apart. Their rusted hinges let out a pair of screams for all those who might have slept through the breaking of the lock. A wash of sudden heat assaulted them, heavy with the odors of ash, brimstone, and burnt meat. It was black beyond the doors, a sullen Stygian darkness that seemed alive and threatening, hungry. Quentin could sense that there was something in that darkness, coiled and waiting. Warrior, grant me courage, he prayed. He did not want to do this, but he saw no other way. Why else would Daenerys have shown me the dragons? She wants me to prove myself to yeah, her. Yeah, why else? <laughs> Garrus handed him a torch. He stepped through the doors. The green one is Rhaegal, the white Viserion, he reminded himself. Use their names. Command them. Speak them calmly but sternly. Master them as Daenerys mastered Drogon in the pit. The girl had been alone, clad in wisps of silk, but fearless. I must not be afraid. She did it, so can I. The main thing was to show no fear. Animals can smell fear in dragons. What did he know of dragons? What does any man know of dragons? They had been gone from the world for more than a century. The lip of the pit was just ahead. Quentin edged forward slowly, moving the torch from side to side. Walls and floor and ceiling drank the light. Scorched, he realized. Bricks burned black, crumbling into ash. The air grew warmer with every step he took. He began to sweat. Two eyes rose up before him. Bronze, they were, brighter than polished shields, glowing with their own heat, burning behind a veil of smoke rising from the dragon's nostrils. The light of Quentin's torch washed over scales of dark green, the green of moss in the deep woods at dusk just before the last light fades. Then the dragon opened its mouth, and light and heat washed over them. Behind a fence of sharp, sharp black teeth, he glimpsed the furnace glow, the shimmer of a sleeping fire a hundred times brighter than his torch. 
The dragon's head was larger than a horse's, and the neck stretched on and on, uncoiling like some great green serpent as the head rose, until those two glowing bronze eyes were staring down at him. Green, the prince thought. His scales are green. Ragel, he said, his voice caught in his throat, and what came out was a broken croak. Frog, he thought. I'm turning into a frog again. The food, he croaked, remembering. Bring the food. The big man heard him. Arch wrestled one of the sheep off the wagon by two legs, then spun and flung it into the pit. Ragal took it in the air. His head snapped round, and from between his jaws, a lance of flame erupted. A swirling storm of orange and yellow fire shot through with veins of green. The sheep was burning before it began to fall. Before the smoking carcass could strike the bricks, the dragon's teeth closed round it. A nimbus of flames still flickered about the body. The air stank of burning wool and brimstone. Dragon stink. I thought there were two, the big man said. Viserion, yes, where is Viserion? The prince lowered his torch to throw some light into the gloom below. He could see the green dragon ripping at the smoking carcass of the sheep, his long tail lashing from side to side as he ate. A thick iron collar was visible about his neck, with three feet of broken chain dangling from it. Shattered links were strewn across the floor of the fire pit among the blackened bones. Twists of metal partly melted. Rhaegal was chained to the wall and floor the last time I was here, the prince recalled, but Viserion hung from the ceiling. Quentin stepped back, lifted, a tor lifted the torch, craned his neck back. For a moment, he saw only the blackened arches of the bricks above, scorched by dragon flame. A trickle of ash caught his eye, betraying movement, something pale, half-hidden, stirring. He's made himself a cave, the prince realized, a burrow in the brick. The foundations of the Great Pyramid of Marine were massive and thick to support the weight of the huge structure overhead. Even the interior walls were three times thicker than any castle's curtain walls, but Viserion had dug himself a hole in them with flame and claw, a hole big enough to sleep in. And we've just woken him. <laughs> he could see what looked like some huge white serpent uncoiling inside the wall, up where it curved to become the ceiling. More ash went drifting downward and a bit of crumbling brick fell away. The serpent resolved itself into a neck and tail, and then the dragon's long horned head appeared, his eyes glowing in the dark like golden coals. His wings rattled, stretching. All of Quentin's plans had fled his head. He could hear Cago Corpse Killer shouting to his cell swords. The chains, he's sending for the chains, the Dornish Prince thought. The plan had been to feed the beasts and chain them in their torpor just as the Queen had done. One dragon, or preferably both. More meat, Quentin said. Once the beasts were fed, they would become sluggish. He had seen it work with snakes in Dorn. But here, with these monsters. Bring, bring... Viserion launched himself from the ceiling, pale leather wings unfolding, spreading wide. The broken chain dangling from his neck swung wildly. His flame lit the pit, pale gold shot through with red and orange, and the stale air exploded in a cloud of hot ash and sulfur as the white wings beat and beat again. A hand seized Quentin by the shoulder. The torch spun from his grip to bounce across the floor, then tumbled into the pit, still burning. He found himself face to face with a brass ape, Garrus. Quent, this will not work. They are too wild. They... The dragon came down between the Dornishman and the door with a roar that would have sent a hundred lions running. His head moved side to side as he inspected the intruders. Dornishman, windblown, Cago. Last and longest, the beast stared at pretty Maris, sniffing. The woman, Quentin realized, he knows mm. that she is female. He's looking for Daenerys. He wants his mother and does not understand why she's not here. Mm. Quentin wrenched free of Garrus' grip. Viserion, he called. The white one is Viserion. For half a heartbeat, he was afraid he'd gotten it wrong. Viserion, he called again, fumbling for the whip hanging from his belt. She cowed the black one with a whip. I need to do the same. The dragon knew his name. 
His head turned, and his gaze lingered on the Dornish prince for three long heartbeats. Pale fires burned behind the shining black daggers of his teeth. His eyes were lakes of molten gold, and smoke rose from his nostrils. Down, Quinton said. Then he coughed, and coughed again. The air was thick with smoke, and the sulfur stench was choking. Viserion lost interest. The dragon turned back to the wind blown and lurched toward the door. Perhaps he could smell the blood of the dead guards or the meat in the butcher's wagon, or perhaps he had only now seen that the way was open. Quentin heard the sellswords shouting. Kago was calling for the chains, and Pretty Maris was screaming at someone to step aside. The dragon moved awkwardly on the ground like a man scrabbling on his knees and elbows, but quicker than the Dornish prince would have believed. When the wind blown were too late to get out of his way, Viserion let loose with another roar. Quentin heard the rattle of chains, the deep thrum of a crossbow. No, he screamed. No, don't, don't. But it was too late. The fool was all he had time to think as the quarrel caromed off Viserion's neck to vanish in the gloom. A line of fire gleamed in its wake, dragon's blood glowing gold and red. The crossbowman was fumbling for another quarrel as the dragon's teeth closed around his neck. The man wore the mask of a brazen beast, the fearsome likeness of a tiger. As he dropped his weapon to try and pry apart Viserion's jaws, flame gouted from the tiger's mouth. The man's eyes burst with soft popping sounds, and the brass around them began to run. The dragon tore off a hunk of flesh, most of the sellsword's neck, then gulped it down as the burning corpse collapsed to the floor. Jesus Christ. The other windblown were pulling back. This was more than even Pretty Maris had the stomach for. Viserion's horned head moved back and forth between them and his prey, but after a moment he forgot the sellswords and bent his neck to tear another mouthful from the dead man. A lower leg this time. Quentin let his whip uncoil. Viserion, he called louder this time. He could do this. He would do this. His father had sent him to the far ends of the earth for this. He would not fail him. Viserion! He snapped the whip in the air with a crack that echoed off the blackened walls. The pale head rose. The great gold eyes narrowed. Wisps of smoke spiraled upward from the dragon's nostrils. Down, the prince commanded. You must not let them smell your fear. Down, down, down. He brought the whip around and laid a lash across the dragon's face. Viserion hissed. And then a hot wind buffeted him, and he heard the sound of leathern wings, and the air was full of ash and cinders, and a monstrous roar went echoing off the scorched and blackened bricks, and he could hear his friends shouting wildly. Garrus was calling out his name over and over, and the big man was bellowing, Behind you! Behind you! Behind you! Quentin turned and threw his left arm over his face to shield his eyes from the furnace wind. Rhaegal, he reminded himself. The green one is Rhaegal. When he raised his whip, he saw that the lash was burning. His hand as well. All of him. All of him was burning. Oh, he thought. Then he began Jesus to scream. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Fuck's sake. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of plan was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just love that George was like, I'm going to have a whole thing with this character. And then I'm just going to have him get burnt up by a dragon. I, I, he's, <laughs> Nothing's going to He's going to fucking go through all of this just so that he can... He's under the impression that he can tame these dragon, dragons because he saw Daenerys do it once. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's no... I don't... I'm not even getting into the blood lore shit, but like... Why did he think he could do this? And, and the fact that he's like, she showed me her dragon so that I would prove myself to her. This My is guy. what she wanted, right? Why? What else are you she... fucking talking about? Listen, like, mm. what did I say a few minutes ago about Hall 
and and then expanding it to like all these men who think that these women want them that these are the women they're supposed to be with and so they do all these weird ass things because it's like proving to the woman that they're worthy or or trying to you know enact vengeance for you know just just like these these fucking bad choices that like on I can't even believe it. and these poor people that followed him in there I want to say they didn't ask for this, but they did sign up for this. Apparently they did. Yeah. But my God, my God, <laughs> I'm glad the dragons is free though. <laughs> Honestly, I, I do for like, it's just so painful to see them all cooped up and chained and everything. Like it really is such a bummer. Mm-hmm. Every time mm-hmm. we are reminded of, of the way that Daenerys is choosing to handle them. And, so in that respect, I can't help but be like, good for you. Right. But. Like, I thought that he was just going to go, like, let them loose. Not that he thought he was going to tame them and chain them up and throw them into the back of a wagon. I cannot believe. I had forgotten about the wagon part. <laughs> and I cannot believe that these motherfuckers thought that they could just stick them in a wooden wagon and then that would be enough like and then roll you know them that away fire right like are you fucking for real and they have this elaborate plan to get in but like how are we getting out with the dragons on the wagon like how are we gonna just throw a tarp over them like, i think they're just like oh we'll have killed everybody by the time it's oh time to God. leave but this is fucking i can't believe this story ends this way this, we've, we've been following frog quentin and like his his entire journey to get all the way to meet Daenerys for then that to just kind of like be a womp womp, right? Because she's mm-hmm. not she's not interested. And so then he's driven to desperation because he's so you know, he's got his head all gassed up from his father's like his mission. And the fact that he's standing there when this one guy is coming for him and he doesn't even go for his weapon. Yeah. And then, like, two or three times, different people have to knock him out of the way because he's just not paying attention. He's just not a, a warrior in this, you know, in this instance or in this case mm-hmm. or in that way. Um, my God. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> just, yeah. So, like, all of that work we did, all that traveling we did, all those plans. Poor fucking... Was the father's name is Doran? Yes. Like, yeah. I feel bad for him because this is his son, but also you sent him on this fucking weird ass mission. Like, I also like the the thing with the word is that they weren't saying Grolio, right? That it was basically like well a giveaway. They had a different right, like so they had a so this is interesting because it's like piggybacking on Selmy's chapter so there were work to get them in right but it, the first time they they hesitated and then one of them said dog then like and so okay fine but not like that was really the word right so it gives like it's like sort of ambiguous like they were just ready for their shift to be over and they're like all right fine whatever then dog sure just we're ready to go home. Um, or maybe there are levels to this shit. You know, maybe maybe different agents. I don't want to call them agents, but different. What do you call that when you're standing guard? Post have mm-hmm. have different um, protocols. Hmm. You know, so maybe. I don't know. Like it could be either the 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 outside guards were just like you got the wrong word. It's not dog, it's Grolio, but we're so fucking tired over our shift, we don't give a fuck. Or it could be that the people who are guarding the pyramids have a protocol outside, the people who are guarding the king have a protocol, you know, because which would make sense because you have this all of these brazen beasts who are all behind masks. So it would be very easy to infiltrate. So having different words for different sections kind of feels like it makes sense to me because you would want to keep that always moving 
because the nature of of the brazen beast is to just be behind masks. So you like having an additional layer of security. But I don't know. Like maybe mm. maybe the word was wrong from gate. But then you have to believe that two two guards were just like, yeah, we're going to abandon our posts, even though you gave us the wrong word. And that feels a little like. I don't know if I have enough understanding of the brazen beast that, that I believe yeah. that that's something that they would do. Um, or maybe they figured like, all right, well, y'all clear and clearly are not in the know, but we are not interested in dealing with you. So we'll let you stand there with the wrong fucking word and somebody else will handle this. You know, like, yeah, it could very well be that it could be like, well, if you're not the right people, because I guess also there might be a sense of laziness attached to this particular detail because really how many people are trying to break into the dragon pit right maybe. so so maybe it's a maybe little, they're just like maybe at your funeral you know what i mean maybe it's a little bit more lackadaisical because like who is going in there who doesn't belong like it's not like a thing it's not a it's not a serious threat like it's not something every night these motherfuckers are trying to sneak into the goddamn dragon pit we can't keep them out like i just don't i don't think that's a thing although Barristan and uh, Skahaz were talking about how the next move is going to be to try and kill the dragon. So they should probably have been more on the alert than usual. Yeah, well, I don't know what the timing of this Quentin chapter is in relation to the Selmy chapter. Like it feels... They're happening simultaneously. That's right. It's feeling like it's happening at the same time. So Selmy wouldn't have had an opportunity maybe to get down there yet to change things up i mean i didn't feel like that was the first time they'd thought of it Skahaz is the one who brings it up to sell me and he's the one that runs the brazen beat i don't know i don't know i don't know but yeah curious what you all think about it but yeah i just find this so funny i just find this so funny like the whole thing like you said nothing but red flags from beginning to end and like part of me kind of wants to give quentin a little credit because he does this and isn't like letting himself feel the fear of it. Yeah. He's not running and away so in that's horror like, the way he yeah, should be. Yeah. So that's like brave as fuck, but also it's just so dumb that yeah. like it crosses over. So yeah, this mm. is like our conversation about what constitutes being brave and, yeah. you know, and what doesn't, and it's different for different people. You know, like I thought that like from the, made in crocodile book the small shot a had exhibited a certain amount of bravery just walking through and for you it didn't hit like that at all and then this here like sounds like quentin is being brave like to to move through his fear his terror to to continue on this mission but it just slaps of like dude what the fuck are you thinking yeah this is nonsense and you are nonsense for nonsense it's nonsense Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) um Mm. but yeah y'all so there goes frog (laughs) jesus christ and he's just a baby too he's just a young thing he's a little boy he's not a little boy but he's a young man he's a very young man trying to grab glory and and fulfill a destiny or you know something that's been put in his head that you know his destiny that that has been put in his head from his father um and how that can trap you and and convince you to hold on to something that you probably should have let go of yeah you know but to admit defeat and to turn around and go home he may not even have made it home, but that wasn't even on his radar. Like his assumption was he would go home in shame. Meanwhile, you know, you safely getting home isn't even guaranteed, but he's just focused on like, I can't like show up and tell my father that this whole thing failed, that she Daenerys denied me. And then I just gave up. Like, that's such a shame. He can't bear it. So instead he comes up with this cockamamie plan (laughs) (laughs) Um, <laughs> oh, cockamamie! Wild, wild. I'm kind of yeah. sad to see him go, like, and to go in that way after all of this time, and at the very like towards the like, because we're getting to the end of this thing now, and like, well, there goes that. <laughs> <laughs>
Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's a. Uh... That's wild. I think I had said a couple times that like it's so weird they didn't include this Quentin storyline, but maybe this is why. <laughs> 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 like, like why devote you know airtime, screen time, resources for something that literally just ends in this fashion, which you know, wild. Yeah. Wild, yeah. Pour one out for our boy Quentin, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, all right. B- before we wrap this up, real quick, I just want to say hi to new patrons. This week we have Alana Dunlevy, Gabby, April, April, and Felipe Agusti. Welcome. So, welcome to all of you. Thank you all so much for supporting the show, pledging, and hanging out with us. Hopefully, y'all will. Uh, be making use of the patrons only content listening to all of this i'm i made some new collections as well putting some stuff together into an easy to find playlist so that uh even the older stuff you know that it's 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 a big process since patreon didn't have like labeling enabled way back when but i'm tracking them down and uh yeah putting putting those together so um if you would like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash unspoiled and don't, if you can help it, sign up on your app because Apple is getting 30% for no reason and you're paying more for no good reason. So just go to your, to your old patreon.com slash unspoiled on your browser, fight the app or do it on your desktop and sign up there. And then all of us that actually do the work will be getting the money right. instead of Apple. And this is a dumb question from an old person. You can sign up on the browser and then use the app once that's all done. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, so it's definitely. not like you're you're chained to your desktop or, whatever, or the browser no. because you've gone up that way. It's just for the sake of signing up. Correct. Okay. Correct, correct. That's a good question, though. I'm sure nobody um, else had that question but me. <laughs> I don't know. I bet somebody did. I bet somebody did. Because um, when you hear and, like something is browser based and you're like your brain goes, uh. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It's not browser based. It's just the, uh, the the spot for sign up is better if you use the browser. So. So, yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thank you all so much for listening. We love you very much. We do. Until next week. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye, guys. You're free. Walter Frey Meryn Chant Tywin Lannister